could you talk about the significance of these developments? Because you've called what Germany has been found to be planning a, an attack on the Crimea Bridge, which has happened several times before. Um, now it's a it's regularly attacked during this conflict, uh, whether through mysterious terrorist events uh, or uh, directly by Ukraine. And uh, what was found, of course, was that Germany was planning to help Ukraine, not just with missiles, but with the planning of an attack on the bridge. There's also revelations that, you know, British uh, personnel are in Ukraine uh, helping do, to do very similar things. So the significance of this, Scott, uh, and, and uh, what do you think the fallout will be uh, from these developments uh, moving forward? Well, I think the first thing is we, in order to talk about this, you have to visualize, you know, what it takes to get policy momentum. <clears throat> the reason why I say that is, you know, the United States well, took an, again, Victoria Nuland, driven American policy, took a very aggressive stance on Ukraine at a time when, for instance, uh, Emmanuel Macron was saying that he doesn't want uh, Europe to be caught in a war between two superpowers, the United States and Russia. Um, and he was talking about, you know, the need for a European security um, framework that was sort of liberated from this American pressure. And so Macron was not somebody who was saying, we're going to send troops to Ukraine. He was the opposite saying, we don't want to push for this conflict. Uh, Germany, <coughs> look, <laughs> Germany was like, we're happy with the energy. Keep it coming, keep it coming, keep it coming kind of thing. And you know, we'll work, you know, we'll play stupid games with Minsk and all that, but we're, we're not leaning forward for a conflict with uh, Ukraine either. The United States is leaning forward very heavily. When you think about policy shifts, all that, imagine a giant ship, a container ship. Um, to get it going, you know, because there's a lot of weight, you have to point it in a direction and then you have to slowly build up a head of steam. And once it gets going in the water, you ain't turning that thing around quickly. I mean, it, you, you, you know, making major shifts isn't a, is, it, it isn't easy. You're, you know, you have to move this mass and, 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 and you can move in incremental, but you're generally speaking to be going the same direction. So once you get foreign policy or national security policy together and moving, there's a mass, there's political mass, there's economic mass, um, you know, there's domestic political, there's diplomatic, economic, all this is moving in one direction. Everything's working together. Um, and so what the United States was doing uh, for a couple of years was getting France and Germany to go from this direction and move them in this direction. And we finally got it. I mean, look, the Germans didn't want to send leopard tanks. They didn't want to send martyr vehicles. Now they did. They didn't. Uh, the French didn't want to send the Caesar artillery. They did. We uh, in the from 2022 to 2023, we got Europe in this direction with the counteroffensive, and they doubled down on that. They, they threw more coal into the engine, and off they went. They, this is the direction they're going. Ukrainian victory because America is there leading the way. Meanwhile, America is sitting there going, "This counteroffensive ain't working." Now they want F-16s. Holy cow! We're we're heading in a direction where you know we're not going to win. This is going to be horrible. And so we started pulling back and slowing down our momentum. And then we start moving. Meanwhile, France and Germany are up doing this. Um, and and what's, what's happened right now is that we have a situation where the French and the Germans are leaning way forward. So are the British because we told them to lean way forward. They're doing things. The French and the British have been providing the, the, the British, the Storm Shadow, the French, the Scalp Missile, these are air-delivered cruise missiles. Uh, they worked to get the Su-24s, which are a Soviet-era uh, you know, fighter bomber. Um, they got them modified so you can not only mount the missile, but you have the avionics inside linked up with the electronics to receive the intelligence package that comes in about you know, where enemy air defense is, where their radars are, all that gets turned into a flight profile for the missile so it could go in and hit the target. And this flight profile is updated after the plane takes off. It'll go up and get a final update. That's why we have reconnaissance assets flying all over the place. And then they they launch and they do attack plan. The people planning that attack plan and doing all the electronics aren't Ukrainian. They're British 
or they're French. And um, the, many of them are on the ground loading in the pre stuff, do, making everything work. All the Ukrainians do is fly and hit some toggles and push a button. But all the other stuff is done by the French and the British. Why? They're leaning forward. That's their contribution. They're leaning forward. And these, these missiles are striking targets in Crimea, um, in addition to targets in, uh, you know, in the Russian uh, rear area. Um, the Germans have been pressured now to provide the Taurus missile. Um, it, it supposedly has more capability, greater range uh, than the uh, Scalp or the Storm Shadow. Um, but the Germans are running into a problem because, the, as you learn from listening to this, uh, this, this tape, the Su-24 can't do it. There, it. It would have to be extensively modified. Um, and then the Germans would have to put guys on the ground to do the same thing that the British and the French are doing on the ground to serve as that middleman to get all the data loaded in, up running. You'd need a, a German team on the ground. And there's, you know, th there's no, not supposed to be German troops on the ground there. So they don't want to have German troops on the ground. Um, and then the Germans would have to be actively involved in targeting. And they talk about targeting, you know, this isn't Ukrainians talking about taking down the Crimea bridge. This is the Germans doing targeting of a Russian, a critical piece of Russian infrastructure. Now there's a couple things here. Some people say that, um, what's wrong with that, Scott? You know, uh, the Russians are bombing critical Ukrainian infrastructure. I mean, fair's play, right? If this was purely a Russian-Ukrainian conflict, I guess you could say that. Fair's fair. Um, but it's not. I, I don't think people remember or understand what's going on in NATO. For instance, if a leopard tank breaks down, it's removed from Ukraine to Poland and sent probably to Lithuania, where there's a leopard refitting facility uh, where they repair the leopard tank to bring it back into... Now, in normal warfare, that place would be bombed. It wouldn't exist anymore because it's part it's participant in the conflict. In Poland, there's intelligence centers there where you have analysts coming together. Or In Ramstein, they're doing the same thing. Logistics flows into Germany, into Polish warehouses, on... In wartime, none of this would be allowed to exist. Russia would be hitting it. Um, Ukraine is getting this huge benefit by having all of Europe to be this safe haven where their logistics, where they can train, where they can build weaponry, where stockpiles can be built up and all this stuff and then filtered into Ukraine. But Russia can't attack that. So the idea of saying, no, it's a good thing to let Ukraine attack the Kerch Bridge. It's a bad thing to let Ukraine attack the Kerch Bridge because what you're encouraging is war. And war means that Russia is going to attack all that stuff in NATO, and then we have a bigger problem. So I, I don't think people understand just how much of a, you know, Russia's fighting this war with a hand tied behind its back because it can't do the things that would, it would normally do to disrupt the flow of logistics and combat support that's coming from NATO, from the safe haven into Ukraine. So we've got that. But then it's the Germans planning it. <clears throat> this is an act of aggression. Germany's not at war with Russia. They're not. I mean, they're participants in the conflict, apparently, but they're not at war. So what Germany's doing right now, and it's not me and people are, Scott, you're just throwing words out there. I don't know. Saxony happens to be a German state, and the Saxon government has uh, initiated Article 13 charges, which is basically the, the German constitution that prohibits people from engaging in acts, you know, uh, wars of aggression. <laughs> well, why are wars of aggression such a sensitive thing? I don't know. Maybe because the Nazis, they were Germans, by the way, um, in, in World War II, carried out a war of aggression against Europe and the Soviet Union. 27 million Soviets were killed. And when the war ended, um, it, I think it was Justice uh, Jackson, uh, American Supreme Court, a jurist who uh, was a prosecutor in, uh, at, at Nuremberg, <clears throat> he said the greatest crime, the greatest war crime of them all is a war of aggression because from that, all other crimes take place. Um, and German politicians, uh, diplomats, and soldiers were hung by the neck until dead for committing the crime of a war of aggression. Um, so the Germans rightfully said at the time, we don't ever want to be in that situation again, but here they are, four German officers, planning a war of aggression against Russia, whom they're not at war with. Now, imagine being the Russians and getting this tape and listening to it, going, hmm. Now, the Russians, I think, <clears throat> nothing took them by surprise. First of all, I don't think this was Russian intelligence. I'll tell you why. 
I used to be in the intelligence business. And um, if, if I were able to successfully tap into the communications of four German Air Force officers who were giving away the farm, they gave away everything in this conversation. Um, the last thing I'd want to do is compromise that. I'd want to say, I want to do this again and again and again. As long Now that I know how to get in there, I want to repeat this. Um, the other thing that happens is when you do something like this, you don't leave um, <laughs> a sign that, you know, Kilroy was here, you know, <laughs> the old World War II thing, you know. Um, uh, apparently, the, uh, this was a, a WEX or something like that. Um, you know, yeah, it was thing. a very basic <clears throat> WebEx system, yeah. Yeah, uh, but apparently, in addition to the four Germans, Somebody else logged in and was hanging out there. And it was obvious. There's somebody hanging out here who doesn't belong here. That's not how intelligence services work. You don't leave telltale signs. If you're in there, you're in there and nobody knows about it uh, so that they speak freely. It just shows you the low level of communication security. Of the You know, password, one, two, three, four. A tough one, guys. Um, you know, even I could break that one. Uh, you know, but, you know, so this, this happened, I think, basically... It wasn't um, it wasn't Russian intelligence that did this. This was some sort of intelligence affiliated um, hacker, or you know, uh, because in Russia they they do. We know this um, <clears throat> outside of in, in Moscow at various universities. There's groups of civilian hackers that are doing it. Sort of, uh, Putin calls them Russian patriots, and they're supervised by intelligence guys who are interested in what, what successes have you had? What have you done? Da, 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 da. But it's not a Russian intelligence because the Russian intelligence guys have their own tools, their own trade craft, and they're not going to compromise that. They're not going to let these civilian hackers know. The civilian hackers are going and doing their own thing. And I think basically somebody was sitting there floating around and whatever and going, hmm, let's see. I'm in. They're letting me stay in. They're talking. Record. Holy cow, look at what they're talking about. And it, from what I understand from Margarita Simignon, who's the editor-in-chief of RT who received this and who published this, there's more of this. So I think that the, um, the Germans, and they say, including Schultz, uh, there's conversations that have been going on in this WebEx uh, thing that this hacking group has gained access to, and she has access to. Russian intelligence would never give Margarita Simignon a highly classified intelligence because you burn the source. Um, if this was Russian intelligence, we, we wouldn't know anything about it. The Russians are reticent. It's not like the United States. It has a, uh, a tradition of, um, intelligence being leaked by politicians. I mean, you don't have to have a security clearance, ladies and gentlemen, just read Washington DC newspapers, uh, when something's happening and you might as well have a top secret SCI clearance because you're gaining access to top secret SCI information. Um, <laughs> because that's how America works. Uh, if you remember that leak when the the stupid kid put all that stuff on the on the internet, the you know he put it in Minecraft or something like that. Uh, he just pled guilty uh, to the crime. That that Massachusetts National Guard guy, um, ladies and gentlemen, you read it. You had for a while there, for a moment, a brief shiny moment, you had the highest security clearances in the land because you were reading top secret code word material, um, and. Guess what? It's not that good. And in many cases, it's wrong because it's the analysis derived from uh, intelligence uh, that was collected using um, top secret code word um, resources. Um, you know, the, the, it's not necessarily the information that's classified. It's how we gathered the information. And so if I'm the analyst and I'm gathering bits and pieces of information and I put it together in a product, and that product is crap, meaning that I got it all wrong. I, I, I didn't guess right. But there's facts in there. It's still going to be classified top secret code word. And so if you make the mistake of thinking, oh, because it's top secret code word, it has to be good. It has to be accurate. Not really. It many times is just pure, unadulterated crap. Um, <clears throat> as much of that stuff that the kid put out there was. But um, the Russians don't play that game. You don't see the Russians leaking top secret information. Uh, the Russians, uh, you know, I, I think are pretty poor at information warfare in terms of trying to um, use the release of information to, um, 
to, to, to change policy. This, this leak by Margarita Simeone, however, is a deviation from that. It's genius. But I think it's because they got lucky enough to tap into a source of information that isn't protected by the security classifications of the real Russian intelligence service and instead made their way so that by releasing that you're not compromising anything. Um, and it, it's embarrassing to the, uh, to the Germans, but you know, what the Germans did here was an act of war. Here's the other big thing about what the Germans did. Germany is supposed to be a democracy and civil military relations is sort of what defines a democracy. You guys know the concept. The president is the civilian. He's the commander in chief. And if he orders a general to do something, the general does it. A uh, general can't say no, or unless it's an unlawful order. Um, the general has to obey the orders. Um, and the policy is made by the president, not by the generals. The generals advise on this. NATO, when they when, when we were talking about expanding NATO, you know, one of the key things that had to be gr you know driven into these former communist bloc nations is the notion of civilian control of the military, absolute civilian control of the military. Germany, when it unified, you know, had to be retrained in this. And uh, supposedly they, they learned what they were, that that was the case. But here we have a situation where the chancellor, who's the highest civilian executive of Germany, has said he doesn't support sending Taurus missiles to, to uh, Ukraine. And the German parliament, sort of the ultimate expression of legislative authority in, in, in Germany, not once but twice, has voted overwhelmingly to reject sending the Taurus missile to Ukraine. So the civilian leadership has spoken, the executive and the legislative branch. There's no difference of opinion, no Taurus to Ukraine. So why do you have German officers who clearly state that they're acting with the knowledge of the defense minister plotting an attack? on the Crimea bridge using the Taurus missile, knowing that they would have to deploy it there and deploy secret people and all this stuff. Now you hear them saying, well, it isn't going to happen. It's unrealistic. It's going to be difficult. Da, da, da. But why are they engaged in that to begin with? It's one thing for them to say, well, this is a contingency plan just in case they say, how do we get these missiles to Ukraine? But they weren't talking about how we get these missiles to Ukraine. They're talking about how do we use these missiles to attack Russia? That's Ukraine's business, not Germany's business. Germany has no business planning an attack against Russian infrastructure. That's an act of aggression. That's a war of aggression. And so what we're seeing here is a collapse of, of civil military um, institutions, uh, civil military control uh, in Germany. And this is, this is very problematic. Um, and we see something similar happening in, uh, in France, I believe. I think that Macron likewise has seen the ship, you know, he's, he's moved in this direction and he's committed to this. And, um, committed to the concept of a, of a, of a Ukrainian victory over Russia. And uh, he's looking around, it isn't happening. So he's basically telling Europe, you got to grow a pair. Sorry to go that direction. Um, you have to, you know, man up um, and, and, and do something. You're cowards if you don't want to deploy your troops uh, to, to Ukraine. He's talking about deploying not NATO troops, but troops from NATO nations who are entering into, um, you know, their own unilateral security agreements with Ukraine to send troops there um, to relieve Ukrainian troops who are currently not on the front lines, maybe guarding the Belarusian border, maybe uh, digging in around Kiev uh, to release them to go to the front line. Cause Ukraine has a manpower emergency right now. Um, I mean, Zelensky has just come out and said, we're 700,000 men short. Where'd they go? I don't know. <laughs> they're all dead, uh, but they're 700,000 men short. Um, and they only have two hundred to 300,000 men available for the front lines, right? And that's not enough. And they're losing men at thousands a day right now. And, the, you know, and they've got nothing, nothing to, to, to hold the Russians back. So they, they're, they need manpower right now. And so Macron, having moved his ship, in the ship of states moving in this direction, all that momentum, Macron doesn't want to hit the brakes or turn around because that makes France look bad. So Macron is saying... In order to maintain this momentum, we have to do something that keeps Ukraine viable. Ukraine needs manpower. That's their number one pressing issue right now, manpower over everything else. And the easiest way to get manpower is to basically put foreign troops in to not in a frontline combat capacity, but in a rear area support capacity to relieve Ukrainian troops who can then go to the front lines. The irony is all you're going to get out of that is 60,000 troops. You're not going to get any more than that. Um, 
but that's better than nothing. Uh, that buys time to, you know, maybe Ukraine can come up with a magic mobilization scheme, which they can't do. Um, but Macron is is committed to this. And um, so the French ship is moving, the German ship is moving, the American ship has stopped. And America now, literally, we're in a situation where our national security has been hijacked by France and Germany because they're doing things that, if they are implemented, commit us to a war that we don't want to fight. And the other thing about this is uh, the American people understand we do have something called the Constitution. Congress is the only body capable of declaring a war. We're not at war with Russia right now. We're, we're going to be at war. France keeps doing what they're doing and Germany keeps doing what they're doing. We're going to be at war, but it's a war that hasn't been um, discussed by Congress. Have, has Congress voted on this to declare war? The President of the United States, of course, can commit American troops under the War Powers Act but only you know in a situation where we've been attacked and it's a pressing issue and he doesn't have time to notify Congress. Um, but has the president said, this is what we want? We want to support this. No, the president's saying the exact opposite. We don't want a war. We don't want American troops there. But we're the American people are ignorant of this. And we're going to wake up one day thinking that, well, it's okay. There can't be a war with Russia because Congress hasn't declared war and the president isn't articulating war like that. He just fired Victoria Newland. So clearly we're not going to war with Russia. We're going to go to war with Russia if France and Germany keep going in this direction because it's inevitable. And that, that means that we've allowed foreign entities to hijack congressional processes, constitutional processes. This is a very dangerous situation for America, for Americans, um, for the world, to be honest. But I don't think most Americans understand how bad things are. You should be calling your representatives, your senators, and demanding that there are hearings about the potential of war with Russia. And is this what we want? Do we want a war with Russia? Because that's what we're getting. And if we don't want a war with Russia, what are we doing to distance ourselves from French actions and German actions? If I were the president of the United States, I'd be calling up Emmanuel Macron and saying, um, we, we won't support you. If you put troops in there, we will publicly distance ourselves from you. And we'll tell the Russians that there will be no Article 5 protection for not only the French troops on the soil in Ukraine, but for France. Meaning that if you take this decision, that means that France is now at war with Russia and you're on your own. You get no NATO protection. Uh, Russia, you, you're free to just take them out. Uh, we don't like them anyways. Um, Germany, the same thing. Sorry, Germany, but if you put the Taurus missile in there and you attack the Crimea Bridge, um, you're at war with Russia. We're not. Uh, you don't get Article 5 protection. We're not riding to your rescue, and Russia has permission to destroy you. Um, we need to do something like that to put these two nations on notice, indeed, to put all of NATO on notice, that there will be no war with Russia. The only way there's a war with Russia if Russia attacks NATO, and we should make this very clear. Um, you know, when it, it's therefore, we need Secretary of Defense Austin to stop saying that you know, there, if we don't win in Ukraine, there will be a war with Russia. Yeah. Well, there won't be unless Russia attacks NATO, which Russia isn't going to do. So what Austin should be saying is we need to bring an end to this Ukrainian conflict so that there's no risk of Russia attacking NATO. Um, but Russia is not going to attack NATO. It's, a, it's an artificial thing. But if we continue to lean forward like that, remember, we're trying what lean forward means that we're getting NATO to create Domestic, political, diplomatic, economic, and national security momentum. It's very difficult to turn around. We need to bring these giant container ships to a halt, and then we need to slowly turn them and move away from the direction of war. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.